the thyroid gland, you know, is in the neck, and, and the, the way it works is the, the pituitary gland secretes thyroid-stimulating hormone, or TSH. And the, the pituitary's job, it's like a control tower, and it kind of monitors the levels of hormones in the body, whether we're talking about thyroid hormone or, or estrogen or testosterone. If thyroid hormone is too low, the pituitary will recognize that, and it will, it will increase the amount of thyroid-stimulating hormone it produces, then that, that TSH travels down the thyroid gland and, and acts on it and, and delivers the message, hey, thyroid, you know, pick up the pace here. We don't have enough thyroid hormone, so you got to make more. Likewise, if thyroid hormone is too high, like in a hyperthyroid state, then the amount of TSH will be low and lower so that the thyroid gland stops producing as much. So that's why elevated TSH is a sign of hypothyroidism in general and uh, low TSH is a sign of hyperthyroidism or to someone taking too high of a dose of, of thyroid medication. Hmm. So once TSH acts on the thyroid gland, then it produces thyroid hormone. Now, about 94% of what it produces is T4 or thyroxine. And T4, interestingly enough, is not very metabolically active. It needs to be converted into T3 or triiodothyronine to have all of the, the main metabolic effects that thyroid hormone has. So only about 7% of what's produced by the thyroid gland is T3. Most T3 is made by converting T4 to T3, or T4 to T3. Now, this happens not in the thyroid gland itself, uh, at least not much, but predominantly in the liver and in the gut and in the other uh, peripheral tissues. So this conversion of T4 to T3 is really crucial. And there are a lot of varieties of poor thyroid function. You know, the, the, the kind of garden variety hypothyroidism involves an elevation of TSH and then maybe a, a decrease in the production of T4 in the thyroid gland. However, actually an even more common pattern that I see is thyroid gland functioning normally and it produces the right amount of T4, but the conversion of T4 into the active T3 is impaired. So what causes this? Well, from a dietary perspective, fasting, calorie restriction, or carbohydrate restriction will all decrease the conversion of T4 into active T3, and it will increase the conversion of T4 into something called reverse T3. Now, reverse T3 is an inactive form of thyroid hormone that's basically a metabolic dead end. So in other words, once T4 gets converted into reverse T3, it's, it's irreversible. It's never coming back. And the important thing to understand about reverse T3 is that it doesn't perform any of the functions of active T3, but it does bind to the T3 receptors, which then blocks active T3 from activating those receptors. So mm -hmm. what happens with carbohydrate restriction is that you'll get an increase in reverse T3 and a decrease in active T3. Well, on the other hand, if, if you see, look at overfeeding studies or people eating uh, a larger amount of carbohydrates, you'll see an increase in T3 levels. Now, there's a couple reasons for this. Number one is that uh, glucose is required to make the conversion from uh, T4 to T3. Number two is that insulin as it turns out, activates the enzyme involved in T4 to T3 conversion. So with uh, zero-carb or very low-carb diets or, or fasting or calorie restriction, you'll, you'll see chronically low insulin levels, and then that will cause a decrease in the conversion of T4 to active T3 or, and an increase in the conversion of T4 into reverse T3. And this is actually also true for not only people with low insulin levels, but for people with insulin resistance because... Mm -hmm. Studies have shown that poor, poor reverse T3 to T3 ratios in people with insulin resistance. So now that I've said this, I, I, I want to talk, you know, maybe we're skipping to the end here, but I want to talk a little bit about the significance of this. Sure, please so do. It's tempting to think that downregulation of T3 causes weight gain. And you mentioned at the beginning of the show that, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I, I can't lose weight because my thyroid is underactive. Right. Well, unfortunately, that's the, the studies haven't really borne that out. Um, researchers have done a lot of studies to try to figure out if, you know, thyroid function plays a strong role in energy, uh, in, in body composition and, and weight. And when you look at studies of obese people with normal thyroid function and obese people with sub, subclinical hypothyroidism, 
there's really no observable difference in energy expenditure and body composition. And then, of course, there have been a lot of trials of uh, where they've tried to treat obesity with thyroid hormone, but they've, ne- they've never really yielded, you know, consistent, impressive results. Mm-hmm. So it lowered T3 or increased reverse T3 may not equate to measurable differences in metabolic rate or weight loss, but there's a lot more to the role of the thyroid than, than weight, weight regulation. As you know, we talked about at the beginning of the show how many really important physiological processes thyroid hormone is involved in, and every cell in the body you know, has receptors for, for thyroid hormone. So I do think that this phenomenon of T4 to T3 conversion that declines on a very low carbohydrate it may very well be significant for people, even if it's not necessarily going to you know, cause weight gain or, or increasing their T3 levels isn't necessarily going to cause weight loss. People are like, you know, I, I know Chris Kresser and others out there, they like to say that low carb leads to low T3 and it's a cause of hypothyroidism. How can this be? My doctor who treats hypothyroidism and insulin resistance had me do low carb and it seemed to work well. How can low carb be both the cause and the solution to the same problem? Someone has this wrong. What's going on here? Well, there's a few ways to answer that question. I think in the most general sense, uh, the one thing I'd like to emphasize is that we're, we're all pr- different. You know, we there, we share a lot in common as humans, but uh, yeah. we also have a lot of differences. And that's why it's very hard to make um, blanket statements in medicine. And right. I'm very wary of anybody who does because uh, what I see on a day-to-day basis is that something that works for one person is not necessarily going to work for the other person. Exactly. And that's because of differences in genetics, differences in environmental risk factors, in our constitution, any number of factors, you know, almost an infinite number of variables. So are there people who are following a a low-carb or very low-carb diet who don't experience this phenomenon? Absolutely. Uh, Does that mean that nobody experiences this phenomenon? Absolutely not. So uh, I think that's why I want to set this up that way um, because I think it's really important to understand. I think a lot of the sort of disagreements and uh, you know, arguments that we see on the internet about these issues is because we're, we're trying to make a sort of blanket generalization that just can't be made when you consider the diversity of, of our physiology. Absolutely. So, all of that said, there are a lot of studies that very clearly document a decrease in T4 to T3 conversion. I think it's, it, it would be difficult to make the argument that that's not happening. Um, I have, we can talk about a few of them if you'd like. Sure, please. Uh, so there's a study by Davidson, uh, and he followed some people that were, and he had, they did five different diets for five days each, and three of the diets were isocaloric, meaning they were designed to maintain their, you know, current body weight based on calorie consumption. They provided about 2,100 calories, and then one diet was 20% carbohydrate, so about 105 grams. The other uh, was two, was 40% carb. So 200 grams, and then, and then the third one was 80% carbohydrate. Wow. And, and then there were two other uh, diets that were hypercaloric, so they're, you know, overfeeding. Mm-hmm. And those provided 4,000 calories with a 20% carbohydrate one and a 40% carbohydrate one. Now, on the isocaloric diets, the 20% uh, carbohydrate diet caused a significant drop in T3. The, the, the mean levels were 69 for all the people on that diet. The 40% carbohydrate diet, their T3 levels were 86, and the 80% carbohydrate diet, their T3 levels were 91. So as you can see, there's less of a difference between the 40 and 80% as mm-hmm. there is between the 20 and 40%, and that's actually, we'll talk about that in a second with another study. On the hypercaloric di- diet, there was, there was no difference between the 20 and 40% carbohydrate intake, which makes sense when I said before that uh, overfeeding in general, whether you're overfeeding fat or protein or carbohydrates, will generally uh, cause an upregulation of T4 to T3 conversion. Whereas fasting in general, you know, when, when you're underneath the, the your uh, maintenance calorie requirement, that will also uh, cause a downregulation of T4 to T3 conversion. Right. 
So uh, another study uh, by Azizi, there were 45 obese subjects, and they, they looked at them after four days of fasting, and then they did a, a refeeding with, eight, with a low-calorie diet, 800 calories, so pretty low, uh, of various different compositions. And then they, so they noticed, of course, that T3 declined during fasting, which is consistent with what we've been talking about. And then refeeding with a protein and fat diet failed to restore T3 levels, but refeeding with a mixed diet, including carbohydrates, caused T3 to progressively return to the levels it was at pre-fasting. And then the carbohydrate-only refeeding diet caused a significant increase in, in T3. Now, here's an interesting thing about this study is that some subjects were taking T4 hormone during the experiment, but their T3 levels still fell during fasting. So this confirms that the decline in T3 that was seen was due to that impaired conversion of T4 to T3 that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Can I just make an observation? It sounds like these lower carb versions aren't even ketogenic. Not necessarily, no. Yeah, I mean, so you, the, could, you could be on a 20% carbohydrate diet and that will decrease the conversion of, of T4 to T3 to some extent. So have there been yeah. any studies that have been conducted on ones that are specifically ketogenic? Yeah, there's a study by Bishop at, uh, and, and colleagues. There was an isocaloric diet with 2% of calories from carbohydrate, mm -hmm. and that decreased T3 levels and increased reverse T3 levels. And notably in that study, uh, thyroid-stimulating hormone didn't change. So what's important about that is that this pattern that we're talking about where T4 to T3 conversion is decreased, it doesn't often show up on a standard lab panel that just measures TSH. Mm. Uh, Finney and colleagues did a study on six uh, moderately obese subjects made a zero carb diet for six weeks, so certainly ketogenic. Mm -hmm. uh, T3 declined by 33% and reverse T3 increased by 72% after just one week. So this adaptation happens fairly quickly. And then T3 continued to decrease slightly but non significantly, uh, while reverse T3 levels actually return almost to baseline after week six. So this suggests that there might be some adaptation which is why some people may be able to do a, a very low-carb diet over a significant period of time without suffering from this effect. I have heard from people in the paleo community that a very low-carb diet can possibly interfere with thyroid function and or stress the adrenals, which might be a culprit in preventing weight loss from happening. Are you aware of any science that supports or refutes this claim? Excellent question, because I've heard that many times. And I've had someone tell me absolutely definitively that you have to eat carbohydrates in order for the liver to have enough glucose fuel to turn the inactive thyroid hormone, called, we call it T4, tetraiodothyronine, into T3, which is triiodothyronine. Mm -hmm. Now, it turns out this person had a bachelor's degree in biology from a very good university, but no other metabolic nutrition or, or medical training. And it turns out that the amount of active thyroid hormone we make from inactive thyroid hormone is measured in the micrograms. That's one thousandth of milligrams amount. And the amount of glucose needed to fuel that conversion, uh, I can't think of how, how to describe something that small. <laughs> it's, yeah. it, it is inconsequential, that argument. The second is that when we put people in the metabolic ward on ketogenic diets, and uh, back in the 1970s and 1980s, we carefully measured thyroid metabolism. I worked with Dr. Elliot Danforth at the University of Vermont, who is one of the, was, he's retired now, but was, was in his time one of the world's experts in thyroid hormone metabolism. We published that data. And the thyroid metabolism, if you feed people adequate calories, thyroid metabolism stays completely normal. Mm -hmm. If you severely restrict calories under 1,000, you know, down in the six 800 calorie day per range, then thyroid hormone levels go down, appropriate with the degree of caloric restriction. But there is no evidence of thyroid failure. And as soon as we give people back full calories, the thyroid response come, ramps right back up. So there is no real or permanent impairment of thyroid function associated with a low-carb diet. That's a myth. Mm -hmm. So there's no need for these 
safe starches, the white rice, the white potatoes, to give you that, your liver that glucose that it needs to prevent these calamities from happening? Simple answer is no, there is no need for those. Right. You know, there is this thing called gluconeogenesis. Right. We, our bodies make carbohydrate out of metabolic leftovers. For example, body fat is stored as something called triglyceride. Mm -hmm. That's three fatty acids attached to a, what's called a glycerin molecule, glycerol. And glycerol is basically a three-carbon sugar alcohol, if you will. Six percent of the energy in triglyceride stored in fat is not in the fatty acids, but in the glycerol backbone. And glycerol can be used to make glucose. Fats can't. Fatty acids can't, but the glycerol can. So six percent of the energy stored in body fat is actually available for gluconeogenesis. So if you're losing weight and breaking down triglycerides and burning the fatty acids for fuel, you've got that glycerol there as a, as a byproduct of fat breakdown that allows gluconeogenesis to go forwards. So we actually measured gluconeogenesis in my bike racer subjects by infusing labeled glucose into their bodies, and we found that at their, the bike racers were producing about 50 grams of carbohydrate per day as glu from gluconeogenesis. Wow. That's from glycerol and from protein breakdown and stuff like that. So there's 50 grams per day already available just from endogenous sources. I, I, I just don't get the argument that there is any absolute metabolic need for any more of it to come from the outside. So getting back to your question, I think it's pretty clear that this, this happens, that, mm -hmm. that you know, T4 to T3 conversion is decreased on a, on a low-carbohydrate diet, where the controversy, you know, where there's still room for discussion and debate is how significant that is. Right. And this is where I think it really varies from individual to individual. I see, you know, I, I kind of... You know, I, I like to say that I see I see the dark side of the paleo and low carb <laughs> world because, you know, someone who goes on a very low carb diet or a paleo diet and they do great and they feel great, they're not going to come see me, Jimmy. You right. I, I'm not going to interact with that person very much. That's so right. The, the, the person that I'm going to see is the person who goes on the very low carb diet and you know all of a sudden their hair starts falling out and they have cold hands and feet and they feel terrible. Mm -hmm. um, so. I know that those people exist because I treat them on a daily basis, and when I, when I instruct them to eat more carbohydrates, those symptoms go away, and because of these studies and because of that response, I know that it's a real phenomenon, but I, I, I would never claim that it is true for everybody. heard that saturated fat can lower T3 levels in Hashimoto's disease, though I haven't been able to find any good information on this. If it's true, can you please explain this further? Now, last week we talked about thyroid health with Chris Kresser, and he talked about how low-carbohydrate diets can like lower T3 levels, uh, as well as starvation, as well as uh, uh, calorie restriction. Uh, but I've never heard that saturated fat lowers T3. Do you have any experience with this? No, I'm not aware of that. Uh, you know, we've measured thyroid levels in our experiments, and uh, we don't see a, uh, a disproportionate decrease in thyroid hormones on, on weight loss diets that are low in carb or versus low in fat. And in weight maintenance studies, we saw no, see no change in, in thyroid levels. Um, I, would, I did not listen to your previous podcast, sure. but I, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in thyroid hormones, but... Uh, um, but again, we've we've not seen changes um, that would indicate low carbohydrate diets um, uh, have a disproportionate effect on, on thyroid hormones relative to other types of diets. Right. And and furthermore, we see no manifestations uh, um, that would indicate um, a a lowering of thyroid, such as metabolic rates and so forth. If anything, we see metabolic rate better preserved mm -hmm. with with dieting on low carbs. So, um, if there is an effect on thyroid, it would it would it would perhaps um, there might be some uh, adaptations in sensitivity of of the. Um, of the hormones in their receptors such that um, maybe you can maintain functioning with a lower level of hormone.
Yeah, Chris Kresser was talking it's about how re plausible. reverse I mean, T3 uh, increases while T3 decreases on a low carbohydrate diet. Okay. But you haven't seen that with the people you've studied. No, uh, we, we haven't done full thyroid panels. Um, mm -hmm. we've, we've looked at T4, T3, but we haven't done um, free levels of the hormone, and, and uh, you know we haven't looked at uh, TSH and, and done right. you know for the full panels it, it, to, to do a full interpretation of that. But we have done you know metabolic rates in many of our studies, and, yeah. and that that's clearly not um, uh, signaling uh, any um, you know ch effects that that would be concerning or reflective of a low thyroid hormone Man. or any other symptomology of you know low thyroid such as uh, you know um, temperature regulation right or, uh, you know hair falling out and so forth right man I would love it if you guys could start adding that because that's kind of a a, a concept that's out there that's really nobody has challenged I may hit you up for a, a, a quote on this and and maybe you know some of the data that you've seen with your own patients uh, but a more thorough analysis of the the various thyroid levels with people on these low carbohydrate diets um, would really be fascinating to see um, uh, tested. Thank you.